Good morning. I think we're going to go ahead and get started with today's programming. Um, I am just here to give you a few announcements, give you the lay of the land. Um, as I mentioned, we do have another conference happening here in the building. So our space, um, we're going to be navigating some space. So I want to let you know right up front where the bathrooms are if you haven't already found them. If you go back out um, by the registration table, they're down that hallway. Three of our breakout session rooms, anything that's M203, 205, and 210 are upstairs down the long hallway. We do have food in the back. Please continue to help yourself throughout the morning's program. We're gonna be in here until about 1045. So definitely fill up on coffee. There's fruit, there's yogurts back there. Uh, continue to help yourselves. And then we're going to meet back in here after our first breakout session for lunch. And lunch should be set up right outside. If I know a lot of you have been to the summit for years and years. And every year, um, the feedback that we get is that you like the summit because of the networking possibilities. It's just an easy place to come and chat. And every year, we supply you with an email contact list so you can connect with people after the summit. You'll notice in your program folders, we do not have a printed email list. We figure we can just email you that email list. <laughs> We're in the 21st century, it's amazing. Um, and along with that email list, we will also be sending you a feedback form. Every year, you give us incredible feedback that we definitely take into consideration, and it has helped improve the summit over the last many years. Um, also, just so that you're aware, there is no wrap-up session today. Um, the programming ends at 3.30, but we will have an optional tour of the Moraine Valley Library. It's something we're asked for every single year. So Tara Jacobson, who is in the back, um, will be leading that. If you will meet her at 3.30 just outside of this room, she'll take you across campus. It's supposed to be a beautiful day, so the walk should be nice. Our campus is beautiful. If you get a chance to walk around or need some fresh air, I encourage you to do that. Um, so, getting to the reason we're all here today, um, you know, this is the 13th summit, and we've been doing this a long time, and definitely we have never done it alone. Um, in the past, our partners have been Illinois State University and John A. Logan College, and they have been incredible support for us over the years. Um, and then in this past year, we have transitioned, and we're moving forward with a new partnership with DePaul University Library. And we are thrilled and excited about this new partnership and the ideas and the content that they will bring to our summit. Um, Heather Jagman and Jessica Elverson have been invaluable help over the past 12 months planning this. Um, but I also wanted to shout out to um, our neighbors to the south. Um, we are videoing all of this today and they'll be watching uh, the keynote live. Um, so we're happy that they're joining us. Elect um, online. Um, and um, just really looking forward to moving forward into the new year with um, our new partners. Um, also, unfortunately, um, our dean, who has been incredibly supportive over the past year, you know, as we move forward in this new partnership and as we do all of this work to make today happen, um, our dean was not able to be here to help us welcome you. Um, and we apologize. Um, she created this amazing video welcome that we're just not able to show, some technical difficulties. So I just wanted to thank her um, now. Um, she's been an incredible support uh, over this past year. Um, so now, moving on to the real reason, again, that what we're here. Heather Jagman's gonna come up and welcome you today and also give us a little introduction to our keynote speakers. Thanks, Heather. Thanks, Tish. So as you know, the summit has a history of providing an opportunity for librarians, teachers, and practitioners across the educational spectrum to come together and share ideas and strengthen information literacy throughout the Midwest. And DePaul is so excited to have partnered with Moraine Valley Community College, and all of us on the organizing committee are so excited that um, you're all here to participate, share, and learn from each other. We're especially excited to host this event that brings together such a variety of practitioners. We have over 170 attendees and presenters today, and that's the biggest summit um, that they've, we've ever hosted. And um, it's a great, big, diverse crowd, too. We've got about 90 people from colleges, universities, and community colleges. Um, but K through 12, we've got over um, 
about 50 people. So it's really a wonderful mix. So we're anticipating this is going to be a very energizing and inspiring mix and um, should really provide opportunities to share our expectations and hopes for students and other learners um, as they travel between our institutions because public libraries are also involved here and have a few presentations today. And we can all work together and discover the intersections of how um, and where we can support those learners and each other. So um, in fact, we hope that Somebody here in the audience, maybe many of you will be inspired to propose a, a session for next year um, so that we can learn how we can better connect. Um, but you know, I don't want to get ahead of ourselves. Let's try and enjoy today. Um, and I'll do that. I'll get us kicked off by introducing our keynote speakers. Trudy Jacobson is the head of the Information Literacy Department at the University of Albany Libraries. She currently co-chairs the ACRL Information Literacy Competency Standards for Higher Education Task Force with Craig Gibson. She received the Miriam Dudley Instruction Librarian of the Year Award in 2009. Her current research involves meta-literacy, including badging for meta-literacy abilities. ALA Editions has recently published the new book she wrote with Tom, um, Meta-Literacy, Reinventing Information Literacies to Empower Learners. Trudy and Tom also offered a meta-literacy MOOC um, this past fall. And Trudy is also very involved in, in advancing Michelson's model of team-based learning by librarians and wrote about team-based learning in communications and information literacy in 2011. Tom Mackey is dean and at the Center for Distance Learning at SUNY Empire State College in Saratoga Springs, New York. He teaches courses in digital storytelling and information design and developed meta the Meta Literacy MOOC with Trudy. In 2011, Tom co-authored the article, Reframing Information Literacy as Meta Literacy with Trudy, for college and research libraries, and that research is what led to the expanded project, their new book on meta literacy. This team also co-edited four books on faculty librarian collaboration for Neil Schumann Publishers. Tom's research articles have been published in First Monday, Computers in Education, the Journal of General Education, College Teaching, the Journal of Information Science, and the Journal for Educa of Education for Library and Information Science. And together, they're going to present this morning's keynote, a keynote, Changing Models, Changing Emphasis, the Evolution of Information Literacy. They're going to focus on three exciting strands connected to information literacy and information literacy instruction. Meta-literacy and its importance for individuals in today's information environment. Threshold concepts, what they are and how they fit into the new ACRL information library framework for higher education and how they might be used in teaching. And finally, they will explore the need for information literacy awareness and teaching to be incorporated into what faculty members do and how this is playing out at our institutions. The keynote will feature highlights from their new book and Trudy will also connect the dots with her current work as co-chair of the ACRL Task Force Revising the Standards. So please join me in welcoming Trudy and Tom. Thanks. Thank you very much for that lovely introduction and thank you all uh, for being here and for inviting us. We're just absolutely delighted to be here and to have a chance to um, engage in conversation with you. Um, we're really trying to embody sort of what it is we're doing in our work in today's keynote, and so it's exciting to have the opportunity to bring the strands um, that were just mentioned together. Um, and we hope that um, this will be sort of engaging and exciting to you as well. Um, we do have um, a Twitter feed that I do want to mention, and it is up here, and it's just pound metal literacy. So if anybody is tweeting, please feel free to use that. Um, I also want to mention, because um, both Tom and I come from academia, a lot of what we're going to be talking about is going to be situated there, and we know that there are others here who are not in that setting, so we'll try to sort of expand as we're able to, but please feel free to ask us questions about that. And um, just one more thing about the questions, because we're going to be talking about a number of different areas, we encourage you to jot down any questions you have as we're going along. I think what we'll do is hold the questions till the end, um, but just so ideas don't escape, um, 
in the hotel this morning, I noticed the little notepad that they provided, so something like catch random ideas. Um, maybe these won't be quite so random, but um, if you could um, maybe keep track of them so that we'll be able to try to answer any questions that you have. Okay. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tom, who will start off the actual presentation. Good morning, everyone. Uh, great to see you all, and I'll just share Trudy's enthusiasm for being here. We're really excited about it. I always appreciate the opportunity to co-keynote with Trudy Jacobson. Um, I think this collaborative uh, aspect really does reflect what we're trying to get across with meta-literacy, and it is interesting how the, the idea has been uh, evolving. Uh, as, as Trudy pointed out, there, there will be these three uh, key points, talking about meta-literacy and badging. I will first talk about meta-literacy, and I'd ask you to kind of think about how this compares to your own understanding of it. I've been following all the tweets out there that have been going on, uh, and it's, it's kind of interesting, some of the debate that's going back and forth and trying to understand what this is. So as we talk about it today, this will be a great opportunity to ask questions when we, we come back up here together and for the question and answer part. Uh, Trudy will be focusing on the thresholds concept and then also discussing uh, information literacy in the disciplines. And we'll have some really great examples as well as part of this discussion, and we'll want to hear from uh, you as well. So what is meta-literacy? Uh, I will, we'll, I'll give you sort of my concept of it, but as this would be a great opportunity to kind of write down your own notes in terms of what you, what you think it is and, and perhaps how today uh, either uh, challenges your own thinking on this or reinforces some of your, your questions um, about what meta-literacy is. I want to start with uh, our youngest fan of our new book on meta-literacy. This is one of my two nephews. This is Jack Thomas Mackey Williams. And uh, I recently sent the book to uh, my sister. And these are not staged pictures. This is a really smart kid who was really interested in the fact that his uncle co-authored this book, book with Trudy Jacobson. So she was tw uh, not tweeting, but she was emailing me, actually texting me these pictures of Jack uh, reading the book. And the videos are better. I'm, not, I'm actually not going to share the videos, but the videos are actually better of him going through the book and reading it. And it's, I, I just find this really fascinating because um, there is something here about how, you know, this, you know we, we tend to think of our students in the now and who they are, but when I think of Jack, he's seven years old, and he has really grown up in this social media world. Um, when he was four and five, he knew how to use my sister's iPhone for taking pictures, looking up pictures. Um, he hasn't tweeted, he doesn't have a Twitter account or, or an email account, but um, the, I, I've, I've been constantly fascinated by sort of his experience with this, and I'm sure if you, if you have kids or nephews or nieces, you're, you're seeing the same kind of thing. He also, because he lives on the West Coast and we're on the East Coast, uh, getting to know Jack has really happened through Skype. We don't get a chance to see him as much as, as we would like to, so he's grown up on Skype. So talking uh, with his grandmother, my mother, it's, the relationship has really been building through a Skype interaction. And it's really just second nature to him. And the same thing with me as well. So he knows us through this virtual medium. And I think that that's what we need to think of. Not only the students that we're working with today, but who are who, Jack's. As Jack moves through this system, how are, how are we prepared to work with him uh, with, with the kinds of abilities, abilities that he he has. And I think it's also important to think about meta-literacy as an evolving concept. And that information literacy as a meta-literacy is something that needs to evolve and change over time. And I think that that's the beauty of it. And I think the fact that so many people are here today talking about this and interested in this topic really shows that that's, this information literacy is something that's going to adapt and change over time. If we look at some of the key elements of meta-literacy, this is really what we identify as, as those elements. It really is, it reflects the kinds of technologies that we have today. So it really is the ability to produce, collaborate, participate, share information, and also to really enhance the metacognitive uh, part of learning. Um, and these things are happening in the social media world. If you're tweeting, you're doing this. But how do we bring this into the educational context so that students, we're not telling students to just close their laptops or turn off their cell phones, but how do we engage them with these, these kinds of technologies so that it, it is brought into the learning experience 
and not something that's just seen as, as a, a threat to learning. I think the meta literacy uh, really reframes, reinvents information literacy in this way and provides really exciting opportunities for learning. I think that we have just been so charged up over this idea since we've been developing it. Prior to the article that came out in 2011, just, just our conversations about it and thinking about it and ourselves using the kinds of technologies, the MOOCs, the badging, we are really experiencing what we're talking about and uh, we just find it as, as a way to kind of reinvent our own ways of, of thinking about this. So this is the latest uh, uh, rendition of this uh, uh, sort of the meta-literacy model. If you go on SlideShare and you look at some previous versions of this, it's really interesting how it's developed. Uh-oh, I have a low battery. Um, hold on a second, I forgot to plug in my laptop, hold on. I knew I forgot something, let's see here. It's good to have these reminders. Okay. And I'm not sure where to plug it in, so if we have someone to help me out with that. It's not an emergency or anything, we still have some battery, but I just realized I forgot to plug in my laptop. So, hey, I just adapted to a technology challenge, so. Uh, <laughs> and it always happens when I'm presenting, I always end up proving that point, that you always have to be able to do that. Do you think Fly? I actually know? Um, <laughs> all right, great, thanks. No one got zapped, it worked. All right, so this is really, um, the latest version, and it's been developing. It really started as a, as a PowerPoint slide, and we had started with these circles, and it's just kind of a very simple idea. And originally, the PowerPoint slide just kind of opened up as a circular design, but um, it has changed a little bit. We originally had sort of collaborate. It was a little too literal. Collabor collaborate was kind of jutting across all of this to show that it intersects. But we realized, actually, in the, in the, some of the final moments of developing the book, that it really should be on the outer circle because in many ways the outer circle is uh, kind of the outcomes of what we're looking for. Those, that's really what we want students to be thinking about. So if you look at this um, from the center, um, you know, we see information literacy as the meta-literacy. So uh, it's interesting that meta-literacy, the term has taken on a, a life of its own and it's advanced even from when we first started talking about it. But we, we weren't saying we want to replace information literacy with this other concept. We were saying that information literacy is a meta-literacy. And so what we intentionally tried to create here is this layer of metacognition as, as key to all of this. And we're not the first ones to talk about metacognition and information literacy, but it is really positioning it as a centerpiece of uh, this, this reframed, reinvented model. So we really see it as critically important. And, and even going from the first article to the second article to the book, that metacognitive piece in, in our, own, our own thinking has really advanced quite a bit. But if you notice, you'll see some words here that are very similar. So the ability to access, determine, evaluate, understand information, which are just some key terminology with, the, uh, with information literacy. Although in the book, we talk about how the ability to determine when we compared uh, information literacy to other, other literacy types, it's not as commonly mentioned in some of the other formats. Um, so we really think it's something unique to information literacy in that that ability to determine an information le uh, need, it actually has a metacognitive component to it because you're really thinking about what that particular need is, what that information need is. And then as you go out in the circle, um, and I see this as kind of a, a circle that can sort of change and move around so it's not fixed, but it is kind of fixed in this image. That's, these are just some of the current trends that we've been uh, working with and thinking about that this really influences our thinking about information literacy. So that the impact of social media, the impact of mobile technologies, uh, online environments, and open educational resources really are, uh, it's a really a fundamental shift, I think, in, in this idea that we're just going to look up information in a book or in a collection somewhere, that it is really dynamic environments. It's portable. You can be anywhere. You are, you could be out uh, in here and accessing your library from a, a portable device. Uh, open educational resources are things that can be shared and reused. So that that's all key, and what that leads to is this outer circle of, uh, you know, that really forces the issue of being able to collaborate 
share information, becoming a, a participant in, uh, in, in these activities, and again, then be able to use information and incorporate, but we just don't feel that that really goes far enough, and that the, that's why the terminolo terminology needs to change and, and adapt. And then key here as well, this ability to produce information so that our students really are seen as active uh, agents and participants, producers, sharing information. And we think that they're doing this, we know that they're doing this, we see them doing this, but not necessarily doing it in, a, in an educational uh, context unless we design the learning in that way. So if we go back to the original definition as we outlined it in the first article, What's it about? Uh, being able to promote critical thinking, obvious connection there to information literacy. That's why it's not something that's just separate. Um, but also having the ability to collaborate in a digital age using all those technologies. Open educational resources really challenge the way we think and act as teachers because it's not just something we own, it's something that we share and something that we're willing to put out there for other people to repurpose and to reuse. Um, that's a real shift, I think, in, in thinking. Um, it's also a this idea of it being a comprehensive framework you know, you know, to effectively participate in social media. So the idea is then it really needs to expand beyond sort of um, access, determine, use information, that it really needs to be much bigger than that. It needs to be all those, ele all those other elements, those characteristics in that, that outer circle. And that it's a unified construct that supports the acquisition, production, and sharing of knowledge. Uh, again, all about collaborative communities. And one thing I'll put out there is that uh, one piece of this that, that, we, that we feel has been a, a little bit confusing is that we're not arguing for multiple literacies or multiple meta-literacies. We're saying that information literacy is the comprehensive overarching meta-literacy that connects to all of the others and that they, those have to be brought into it. So those characteristics have to be brought into it. So another group has already done multiple literacies. This we see as being very different because we're saying that information literacy, when you really analyze it, a lot of those key characteristics also relate to media lit literacy, digital literacy, um, all the other literacy types. So that there's, it's a framework that's inclusive of, of those other pieces. And I think there's so much more that can be done with that. And I think that we're just scratching the surface of that idea, but it has been, I think, misunderstood in some of the, uh, the in interpretations of, of the concept. So we see information literacy as that overarching meta-literacy. Um, so we're really excited about this. Uh, I think that uh, one, oh, one thing I want to say about why that's important is that one of the ideas that led to this is that every time there's a new technology, there's a new literacy type. So what we were saying was, instead of, okay, mobile literacy, because we now have mobile devices, another recent one I heard was Google literacy. Okay, Google literacy, you don't need Google literacy. We have information literacy, and information literacy is a meta-literacy, so we got it all figured out. Um, but you don't need Google literacy. Uh, if you have sort of this expanded conception of information literacy, I think it's covered. And I think that the, the problem with having so many different literacy types is that it just ends up becoming confusion, confusing and it seems to be, res be responding to the actual technology type and not the, the learning that needs to happen so that a student can adapt to whatever the technology is. So I think there are some key characteristics we can all learn as we're using these different devices. We don't have to come up with another set of, of uh, uh, literacies. It doesn't mean that sort of everything can be pulled under un one umbrella because there's some pieces of the different literacies that, that might not work, but I think that we have to constantly be aware of, of what those characteristics are. So I probably just made it even more confusing, but that's my statement on the matter. We can, we can discuss that later. Um, another uh, point here is, this is a, 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 a recent piece we wrote as well, is that meta-literacy empowers learners to participate in interactive information environments, equipped with the ability to continuously reflect, change, and contribute as critical thinkers. I think there's a real, there's a real sort of development in, in our own thinking about this, because as we kept working with the Meta Literacy Learning Collaborative, uh, as we kept talking about it, this idea of empowerment kept coming up. And it wasn't empowerment that we empower the learners, it's that the learners empower themselves because they are equipped with these abilities and they can reflect on their own thinking so that they can constantly adapt and change over time. So that is empowering. We're not granting the empowerment upon them, 
uh, we're providing them with the resources and the understanding of their, of their own thinking so that they are empowered. And I think it's a continuous ongoing activity. And it especially relates to these participatory environments where you want to be empowered uh, and you want to interact and you want to have a voice in social media that's relevant and meaningful. Um, so that that's all, uh, uh, I think, really important. Now in the book, uh, this is again trying to make this point that meta-literacy is not about introducing yet another literacy, since that's what we were trying to work against, um, but rather reinventing an existing one, information literacy, the critical foundation literacy that informs many others while being flexible and adaptive enough to evolve and change over time. So we really need that in the profession as well. I think we, we need the flexibility to adapt and to, to incorporate these, these emerging um, ideas. Uh, but again, we see that, we see that as, as core, acknowledging that the term meta-literacy meta has taken it, in some ways taken on a life of its own. So as teachers uh, ourselves, so if you think of everyone who's, who's in this, this room, we're here because we want to think about how, how does this impact either our, you know, our teaching in a library or teaching classroom or teaching online, teaching K through 12. And I'm so impressed that there's such a, a mix of, of people here today from different uh, educational settings. So that meta-literacy promotes a very different teaching and learning dynamic that needs to be present in, in, the, in, in the teaching of both groups. So that it really challenges us, you know, we can identify these, these different uh, characteristics in the, the kinds of technologies that we're engaging with today, but that really challenges us to think about how we're designing uh, assignments or designing uh, sort of badging uh, quests. Uh, designing a MOOC, thinking about the audience. Uh, it, it really, uh, it might even challenge us if you're, if you're doing one-shot sessions of how, how do you do that with, with, these, with these ideas. And this is an important point as well, and I, I hinted at this, but I, I think this is really true, this idea that students rarely see themselves as producers of information, only as consumers, even though they may be very creative with emerging technologies outside of school. We probably see this all the time. I'm sure you're seeing your students with cell phones, you know, cameras, uh, laptops. Uh, I think that there's something that's, that's fundamental that's happening there, and I think that they're, they're very sophisticated uh, in, the, in their use of those tools, but they may not necessarily be seeing themselves as producers in those environments, especially within an educational context. And in some cases, they might be discouraged from uh, using resources such as Wikipedia, for example, because it's being, they're being told it's such a bad resource without being told that it's also a resource that they can contribute to, which is a very different dynamic. It's not just going to this, this site. It's, well, if you're going to produce something and put it on Wikipedia, what would it be? And, and what are the elements that you need to be thinking about? And it really is, it's writing, right? So it's, it's key. It's writing, it's research. It's all those things that I think are central to information literacy. Uh, but it is a shift. It's really encouraging, empowering students to think of themselves as producers in these environments. And this point too, that um, very often it's probably they're still being asked to write papers. Uh, but what about these other media formats? We know that a, a fundamental shift has happened in the kinds of technologies that have emerged and that continue to emerge. The, the kinds of things we have today are going to be very different in, in five years. So again, it's, it's returning to this idea that we want them to be collaborative, we want them to be producers, and how can we do that? One key aspect to this too is, is the metacognitive piece. And again, I think we've just, we, we've delved into this in much greater detail in, in the book. It was always a, a part of it, um, but this idea of thinking about one's own thinking. Um, and a lot of people have written about this. We return to uh, Flavel's work, that original, essay, which I just thought was really interesting because it, he, he talks about it in such an um, easy to understand way. Um, this idea of cognition about cognition or thinking about one's own thinking, and this is a different, from a different source, is this is happening whether you know, we're aware of it or not. Um, and I think it has a real impact on how learners uh, see themselves. So a learner, just think of the sort of metacognition that's probably happening, happening in a Google search. Uh, as students search and find things, they're, they're kind of, uh, they're, they're thinking about what they're finding and searching is going to change. And they might even end up having misconceptions about what they, they find. They might think that th 
the kinds of searches they're doing are, are fine because they're, they're getting an endpoint, they're finding something. But they're, you know, they might think that they're really good searchers and when they're, they might not be. And that's actually something that's, that's, in, the, that's in the book. Another example is um, this idea that we're constantly, I think, creating a sense of uh, who we are based on our, our thinking about our own thinking. And an example, I was actually thinking about this this morning, that um, in seventh grade algebra, you know, I was always a good student, but in seventh grade algebra, I just did not get it. I wasn't interested in it. And my own thinking to this day is that I'm not good at math. Um, so now, you know, I'm, I'm a dean of this large center. I'm dealing with budgets. I'm dealing with personnel. I'm doing math all the time, but still, that idea that I'm not good at math still follows me to this day. So that's my thinking about that because of that experience. So this is this is something that's always happening. Sort of, how can we impact student thinking about their own thinking? How can we leverage metacognition in a way that advances their thinking? Composition teachers who are asking their students to journal really get this, because they're asking their students to reflect on what they're writing about. Um, and that's, that kind of work has been, been happening uh, for years. But I think what it does is it, it allows the uh, uh, sort of this metacognitive piece to happen where students um, are much more aware of their own learning. So it's not just us telling them and assessing them. It provides them with the tools to really assess themselves. And I think hopefully in a very positive way. This is another model we created just for the book. And this is sort of what we see as the, the meta-literate learner. Again, very simple circular design, the fact that this could happen any sort of entryway here with the obviously the learner at the center. Um, and th through our work with the meta-literacy learning collaborative, we really realize that it's not even just the metacognitive piece, that it's really this these four domains. So the behavioral piece is important. So what students should be able to do upon successful completion of a learning activity. Uh, the cognitive piece, what students should know about uh, upon successful cl completion of a learning activity. And that tends to be where we, we always position uh, the, the information literacy pieces. But then also the, the effective piece, uh, sort of emotions and uh, thinking about um, so how someone feels about sort of their their engagement, and then the, the metacognitive, how a learner thinks about their own thinking. So it's really these four things um, that are part of meta-literacy, part of an expanded information literacy. So if we're putting this, the student at the center of this and we're thinking about this in our own learning activities, what we hope is the outcome is, again, all those active learning uh, pieces so that the student then becomes the participant, the communicator, the translator, the author, the teacher learner becomes teacher through this process. Um, we're not just pushing out information to the, to the student, collaborator, producer, publisher, researcher. And many of these things are happening, but uh, we, I think we really need to foreground it and ramp it up in our own teaching uh, so that it happens more. And so that we, again, are thinking of the student, all of these active learning pieces, really empowering pieces, because it's, they become the teacher, it's not just us. Um, and I don't think there's anything more powerful than that when you, you work with a student and you know, you're learning from that student. So um, meta-literacy is metacognitive. Uh, this metacognitive meta approach challenges a reliance on skills-based. So what I'm talking about here is really moving beyond just, just the skills. Um, and it's really much more about knowledge acquisition and how that's done collaboratively, which is a whole other key piece of this, that we're not just in silos, that we learn as when we work with others. Um, and this is one of my favorite images that conveys this because uh, it's a self-portrait of uh, Judith Lester. And any self-portrait you look at, I think this is really metacognitive because it's not just a picture of an artist at an easel, it's how the artist uh, sees herself as an artist at the easel. <laughs> So it's the, the artist sort of stepping back and having that awareness of who they are. And if you look at all through art history, it's just fascinating um, how artists see themselves. That, to me, is metacognitive. That's a much deeper, deeper level understanding of, of who you are. Um, so I just want to talk about massive open online courses quickly, and then I'll, I'll give this back to, to Trudy to talk about badging and meta-literacy. 
Um, because I think this really exemplifies some of these ideas, and it's an environment that, that can really enhance this. It can also can be an environment that doesn't support it as well as we'd, we'd like it to. So if you, and I'm sure you've all heard of massive open online courses. How many people have taken a massive open online course? Okay, cool. How many people have taken a connectivist massive open online course? How many people have taken a Coursera? Um, or these, some of the other, edX. Okay, so a little Coursera, a little edX, not too much with the connectivist. It's really interesting, the connectivist or the CMOOC was really the first kind of MOOC. It really was an, a learning experiment from George Siemens and Stephen Downs. Um, they really wanted to just open up their online course to whoever wanted to uh, attend the course, which is kind of very different thinking. So it's an online environment, we've had that now for, for years, but they really wanted to open it up and see what happens. And it's based on this idea from George Siemens that, uh, based on connectivism. And connectivism really is that we learn in networks, and what we learn happens through this collaboration and what we learn through uh, these, these social contexts. And by opening up an online course in a massive way uh, could change the way you think about it because you're actively engaged. So it's much more of a discursive community that creates, where you create knowledge with other people. Um, so uh, the first ever was connectivism and connectivist knowledge. Um, our first ever MOOC at, at Empire State College uh, was called Creativity Multicultural Communication by Betty Hurley Das Gupta. It was the first one in the SUNY system. It was a connectivist MOOC. And Stephen Downs actually provided us with uh, the programming called Grasshopper so that we could create this. So that when we created our meta-literacy MOOC, we were looking at all these different options. We wanted to go with a connectivist MOOC because it just matched meta-literacy perfectly. Uh, it allows you the, the Grasshopper software is, it, programming is basically an RSS aggregator that allows you to pull together um, feed, uh, Facebook, Facebook posts and Twitter feeds and, and blog posts. The X MOOCs are the uh, edX, Coursera, Canvas network, and they're very much like an online course that's open up to, to more people. So even though they might have, as this quote mentions, that they might have discussion boards, and then I'll, I'll read from this, uh, each student's journey trajectory through the course is linear, because it's like an online course, and based on the uh, absorption and understanding of fixed competencies. So it basically is an online course that's open up to a lot of people, but it has a structure to it. And then I'll just show you our meta-literacy MOOC. Um, this is just the front page of it, and uh, I, I encourage you to check it out. What was really interesting is that everyone who participated in this had a blog, and then once they sign up for it, um, they become a part of the course because the Grasshopper aggregator uh, pulls all of those feeds together, whether they tweet about it, whether they, they post about it in their blog, and creates a newsletter. So they were creating knowledge through this connectivist MOOC. It was connectivist learning. Uh, very different than putting a, an online course that's just open to everybody. And we also use these Blackboard Collaborate sessions. This is Paul Prinsloo from uh, South Africa, from UNISA. And uh, we had all kinds of guest speakers come in. So we were able to expand this internationally. And all those, re all those talks are still available. So we would have the talks. Um, this is a very interactive environment. The, the Blackboard itself, uh, the Blackboard Collaborate session, you'd have a chat room happening in there. And then after, all of this is archived, so you can actually go in and, and see these. He gave one of the best ones. Paul was, was fantastic. And, um, and it's interesting, too, I've been seeing the meta-literacy tweet. People are discovering, still discovering the MOOC because it's an open educational resource. Everything's open and available. So even though we're not facilitating it currently, um, it's still out there, so you can learn a lot about uh, meta literacy through this, this through people who were participating. So that's just one example. Uh, I'm going to hand this over now to Trudy, who's going to talk about uh, a little bit about the MOOC experience and then transition to badging, and then we'll be back together and take some questions. Thank you, Tom.
So Tom was telling you about connectivist MOOCs, C MOOCs versus X MOOCs. And we really did think that this model of the connectivist MOOC is just perfect, as he said, for meta-literacy, because we wanted students to be reflecting on their own learning. We wanted them to be uh, making connections, going out and finding information that they found value in, that they could bring to the conversation. We had over 550 participants in the MOOC. Um, the vast majority of those were professionals in the field but I was teaching a course of approximately, at the start, 18 or so students. They signed up for this course, not because they thought this would be a truly exciting educational experience, but because they needed the general education information literacy credit. So uh, we had the intent that I've just been talking about, that this would really be a way to learn in a new way. You noticed that I said we had about 18 students at the start. Okay. The reality was that these were undergraduate students, mostly juniors and seniors, but they were very unused to this model of learning. And they actually were unused to online learning at all. None of them had ever taken an online course. None had taken a blended course. This was a blended course. They were doing the MOOC. They were coming to class. Um, I heard something from them I never thought I would hear, and that was, could we have more in-class sessions? I think it's because they didn't really get the MOOC and didn't really want to do the MOOC. So they thought that they could sort of fudge it. Um, but the self-direction that was involved was just so new to them. And um, it was not a successful experience. I did have about seven who completed the course. Um, and um, with varying success of those seven. So uh, something that we really thought would be an exciting experience, but really there needed to be more education. I was trying to do some of it, but um, and maybe as students become more used to self-directed learning or at least just taking online courses and needing to meet requirements for that, something like this might work. So we had the best of intentions, but for the undergraduate students, it was not what we had hoped. Okay. So, um, so that was just a follow-up on the MOOC that Tom was talking about. I'd like to talk about another initiative in connection with meta-literacy, and that is badging. How many of you are familiar with badging, um, like in the Boy Scout, Girl Scout sense, <laughs> and in higher education or in education in general? Okay, so a number of you. So this idea has been sort of um, translated from the type of badging, you know, where you'd have your sash and you'd have a badge on it. I was not a very good Girl Scout, and I don't think I had very many badges. Uh, so Tom mentioned the Meta Literacy Learning Collaborative several times. We took those slides out, but let me just tell you a little bit about it. Uh, it was a group we had gotten a grant, and um, a number of faculty members, uh, librarians, and uh, instructional design technology people from throughout SUNY. Uh, were committed to working on meta literacy, and you'll see some of the effects of that in the badging and some other elements. So, with the badging, this was one of the things we said in the grant that we would look into. Um, I'm thinking, badging? You know, are you kidding me? Um, I wasn't a really good Girl Scout, so here we're going back to this metacognitive thing. You know, uh, you know, I'm not very good at that. I'm, I'm not sure this. You know, you got to be, you know, with the professor to to learn. Um, so anyway, um, uh, I was proven really wrong. Uh, but uh, so there's some elements of gaming here, some quests, some challenges. There could be more than that. Um, that's what we're doing. Um, but these badges are shareable. So if you, with competency-based education that badges go with, if you can show that you are capable of doing something, you have mastered it, um, then you could share the badge that you get on LinkedIn or an online portfolio or an online resume. Um, so 
Um, here is a sort of visual image of um, the badging, a great image that Tom found. Um, and so uh, this is something where we decided, you know, we said we'd look into it. Okay, so we'll look into it. The people on the grant were all type A personalities. And so you put us in this badging system where we're gonna learn about it. And all of a sudden it's like, how many badges do you have? How did you get that one? You know, I'm gonna figure this one out. Yeah, so you get really sucked into it. So, um, so in our exploration of it, we, um, like when you are teaching, you come up with your learning objectives. And we had meta literacy learning objectives that are up on the metaliteracy.org site. Um, here you're just seeing the, the four major ones. There are the goals and then the objectives that follow. And anybody who comes to our breakout session will learn a little bit more about this. But um, what we wanted to do was to take the objectives that fall under these four goals and um, have learners um, sort of get what we've been talking about as meta literacy through quests and challenges and um, being able to show that they can do this and they feel confident. Um, Tom talked about, you know, they're being empowered through what they see that they can do. So that was goal one. Um, the second goal, understanding personal privacy, information ethics. This sounds a great deal like one of the standards for the information literacy competency standards. So there's a lot of overlap at the goal level. But if you're looking at the objectives in connection with meta literacy, there really are some decided differences. Two examples, uh, one of the learning objectives with meta literacy this view of information literacy is to differentiate between the production of original information and remixing or repurposing open resources. So moving a little bit over. Or distinguishing the kinds of information appropriate to reproduce and share publicly um, and uh, private information and sort of how, how you disseminate the different types of information. Okay. Uh, let me just quickly finish up with these. Goal three is sharing information and collaborating in the participatory uh, environment. Some divergence here from traditional views of information literacy because there's a more communal or social aspect as Tom had been talking about. And with the fourth one, um, it, this one goes uh, rather broad. There's some overlap with information literacy here at the goal level, but the, again, the objectives, such things as demonstrate self-empowerment through interaction and the presentation of ideas. Uh, gain the idea to see what's transferable. We always want students to understand what they're learning is transferable. We also say translatable and then teachable. So learners are both students, but they can also be teachers. And that idea to them is very empowering. So um, we developed a badging system, and this is just an outline, not really meant to be readable. We understand there would be issues with that. Um, but um, it does give you an idea. This is just one of four badges, the Master Evaluator Badge that's part of the Meta Literacy, it's like Uber Badge. Um, and you can see the level of complexity here. So these small ones with the very monochromatic um, designs next to them are the quests, sort of lower level things that work up to, um, so we're working from the bottom up, and so the next level up would be the challenges, okay? And, um, and then you get to content badges and then this sort of master badge, the master evaluator badge. And so there's a lot here. This goes with all these learning objectives from the meta literacy um, goals um, and their learning objectives, but they build. And they go from the quests where learners are going out and trying things, and then they, as you get up higher, they really need to reflect more upon them. Okay. So, um, this is just the badging site, which you are welcome to go to. It's um, metaliteracy.learningtimes.net. And um, Tom, maybe at some point can tweak that so that'll be available. 
and um, so metaliteracy.learningtimes.net. And you can sort of get a sense of the welcome that we provide to learners when they register. Um, they can then start accumulating, um, working their way through the quests and the challenges and so on. Um, these are a bit different. Many of us have online tutorials. Um, they're, in this, there is absolutely no automatic acceptance of the work that students do. So we're using this um, both teaching our own courses and with faculty members, but there needs to be a commitment to reviewing the work that the learners are doing. And so I wanted to show you just one item. This is content analysis overview. Um, thinking back to that chart, this is pretty high up. And it's um, synthesizing. The student needs to synthesize everything they've learned from a number of quests and challenges. And this student, um, we'd been talking about visual, uh, visualization of information. So she included that element. And what she did um, here is uh, on the green, it says, depending on your personal angle, many different takeaway stories. Um, realities can be spun, generated, promoted, look closely. So what she's doing here is um, providing information on what she was thinking about as she did this. Um, just really, it's so exciting to see this. Um, so the preliminary observations. I used this in the fall, and then I used it in the spring. I was teaching an eight-week quarter course. I showed you that entire, that one badge with, there's like 23 elements in there. About 12 of my students did all 23 of those in the eight week course on top of websites they were producing. It's a one credit course. Um, I always get comments, this course is too much work, and it's a lot of work. Um, they were so engaged this time, nobody told me that. They work in teams. They did tell some of their teammates that, but they didn't tell me, and when many of them got the opportunity, to, because I actually raised it to two credits for those who wanted to finish the badge, I was able to do that. Many of the ones who had been complaining were really excited about the opportunity of going for another credit, and they finished up all that they needed to do. Uh, so very engaged. Um, the work that they submitted was, in many cases, extremely high quality. It's just amazing um, to see what they were doing. I, I should tell you, please don't tell future students, um, but my course is based on 1,000 points. We all know you just divide by 10, um, but if a quest is worth 15 points, they take it pretty seriously. Um, it's really worth 1.5 points. Um, and um, they weren't acting like that. So either they didn't figure it out um, or they just enjoyed doing it. So really good work um, and interest in earning the badge. And I was thinking, well, they'd want to put this on LinkedIn or wherever. But a couple of students told me, I want something to talk to employers about when I go for an interview, something that's a little bit different. So, um, so the faculty are obviously the ones who've bought in are interested because although we started for one or two of them grading their students' work, um, their two have been doing it quite regularly since we started it. They have 75 students each semester, so it's 150. I have one person working on my department on you know, grading. She couldn't do it all. They watched what she was doing because they could sort of see with their students what was going on in the background, and then they took it over, which is really great. Talked to another person who I said, you know, I can help you with the grading. She said, no, my students want to do it. Um, really surprised. So they are willing to take that time. Okay. So moving from the badging to the threshold concepts. Um, and this is what we're working on. Um, Troy is a member of the task force um, for the ACRL, Association of College and Research Libraries. Information literacy 
framework for higher education, the new name, um, a draft that we're putting together, many of you I'm sure are aware of it, that we are proposing will take the place of the competency standards that were approved in 2000, which are showing their age at this point. And so these threshold concepts, um, it's fairly new concept itself came out of uh, work that was being done in the United Kingdom um, in other disciplines, not in information literacy originally. Um, um, three and now sort of four researchers, including Laurie Townsend, who is a member of our task force, um, here sort of describe threshold concepts and their criteria. Jan Meyer and Ray Land are to Jan Meyer and Ray Land are two of the original people who worked on this idea of threshold concepts. But they're the core ideas and processes that um, are significant in any given discipline. But they often go unrecognized by practitioners. And I'm finding that myself as I think more and more about this. These are the things our students really need to understand um, to be able to successfully sort of practice what we're teaching them. We've all talked about we don't want to turn our students into like mini librarians, but there are important things that we know that will sort of get them over the threshold that will really help them in a way that you know, some of the skills-based um, instruction just doesn't do or they're learning. So. Um, so threshold concepts are, by def the definition that's been proposed for them by Meyer and Land, transformative. They cause the learner to experience a shift in perspective. They're integrative, so they bring together separate comments, could be learning objectives, into a unified whole. They're irreversible. Once you get it, you get it. You don't go back to this level of sort of not really understanding. Uh, they're bounded. Okay. That doesn't, we're finding, is not applying so much to information literacy because of the nature of what we do. Um, but they, for other disciplines, sort of define the boundaries of a discipline and are perhaps unique to that discipline. And then the last one, troublesome, um, they're often the difficult or counterintuitive ideas that cause students to hit roadblocks in their learning. Um, so while I'm trying to figure out why my slide is not advancing, um, what I <laughs> want to do is just with that transformative, no, I can get it to advance now, so I'll come back to the idea, uh, the thought I had. So um, this is the website for those of you who are interested in seeing the work that the task force is doing. We've put out two um, segments of our first draft that involve these threshold concepts that we're talking about here. And um, we're doing more than just using these concepts that were identified through uh, Townsend and Hofer and Brunetti's work, but also coming up with supporting elements for them. So there are the threshold concepts and how they can be integrated into the teaching or the curriculum, knowledge practices, what abilities would we like learners to have um, to show that they're making progress or have crossed the threshold. What dispositions, going back to the affective elements, or what habits of mind are important? Um, Self-assessments, this goes back to the metacognition. What do they need to be thinking about and sort of checking on themselves to see if they understand this? And then um, what assignments and assessments, we're thinking of providing examples, but this is not prescriptive. It is dependent upon the situation that you're in and the teaching that you are doing. Um, so, um, and some sample threshold concepts. These are three out of probably six that we're, we're um, using from the work of um, the researchers. Scholarship is a conversation. 
research is a process of inquiry. Authority is contextual and constructed. I'm only going to have a very brief uh, look at one of them, but if you think about these, these are things that are, are, have been included in our teaching for a long time. Um, scholarship is a conversation when I thought I wasn't going to be able to move my slide. What I was thinking about is I used that in my course where I was um, causing my students to go into work overload, um, but I took out some things in that course and I put in the scholarship as a conversation. Again, mostly juniors and seniors that I tend to end up with in this course. Um, and so I was thinking in their own disciplines, they would probably understand this idea of um, the conversation going on, to have ideas developed, for knowledge to uh, happen. And I, I introduced the idea of like a seminal work. Totally unknown to every student in that class. But as we talked about it, I asked them to try to find something like, it didn't have to be a seminal work, but a work that obviously had had influence in the, the field that they were working on, and then how people worked with it. So this scholarship is a conversation. It really had a very animating effect on the students, and there seemed to be learning going on that was not happening when I was saying, okay, for your topic, you need to find a book. You need to find a reference book. You need to find a journal and a magazine article. It was just, it transformed what was happening in that classroom. Um, so, um, and many of them were seniors about to graduate and it just sort of opened up this new view. Okay. So here's one. This is not the full description of the um, authority is contextual and constructed threshold concept. It is actually, uh, part of a summary of the text of it. But just to give you an idea, and I didn't want to put a ton of text on these slides because there's one that's going to have a ton of text and I didn't want to do too much of that. So authority of information resources depends upon their origins, the information need, and the context in which those information resources um, were created and will be used. Okay. So to go with that, the dispositions, and there's just one here. So they're motivated to find authoritative sources and recognizing how this authority could be manifest in unexpected ways. I once taught a, a course um, that used social media and we, um, rather than more traditional sources, and we told students to go out and find like blogs that would be authoritative. And I think this is changing, but they really just, you know, no, they're blogs, they can't be. So it could be manifested in unexpected ways. Knowledge practices or abilities. So maybe recognize that authoritative content can be packaged formally or informally and might use dynamic user-generated information. And then the self-assessments. So an example, challenge yourself to find sources where the authorities really maybe not as clear as it could be. And the assignments or assessments, um, this is just one. The reason it's long um, and the reason why I picked it is because this was in our second iteration of uh, the two n threshold concepts we recently put up. We started to put in more information. And so um, here we're mentioning this could be something done in a lower level course, maybe in a one-shot session. There's a lot of concern about that. We really need to extend the conversation with faculty members, and we think threshold concepts will do that, um, but for current realities. We mentioned that this overlaps with the format, uh, probably it's going to be is process, but that name may also change, uh, another threshold concept. But here's something maybe that you could do, and actually the content here isn't absolutely critical because we're not saying this is what you have to do. Just here's some ideas, think about them. How would this work in your setting? Okay, okay. So last segment. Um, people wanna take a stretch break for a minute? Take a minute, 30 seconds, whatever, just stretch or move or um, you've been sitting a long time. And then we'll finish up with this and then we'll uh, give questions and um, stretch break is turning into a, uh, a restroom break. So we're going to regroup in th three minutes. Good luck, women.
Okay, so if we could start to regather um, in maybe about a minute, I'll get started again. Okay, so what I'm going to try to do in this very short uh, final segment is to try to pull it all together. Um, Tom talked a lot about meta literacy, what it is, how it's um, information literacy is that meta literacy. Uh, talked about badging. Um, talked about what did I just talk about? This is sad. Okay, threshold concepts. And um, sort of how this could fit together sort of in the disciplines. So for those of us who are working with faculty members or if you're working with teachers, um, how could these maybe go together? So, okay. um, both opportunities and challenges in the disciplines. And um, the first one is that Librarians really can't do it all. Um, we want to. Um, we often, um, and I know I often feel, well, if I do it, then it's going to be good. Um, but um, it, it, there's just, there's so many students and there's just so many of us. So um, we really need to get more buy-in from others. Um, but then um, there's some faculty members that I work with 
have a really good idea of what information literacy is. And then there's the accounting faculty member who said, my students all know how to use spreadsheets so they're information literate. So um, there's that worry and tension there. Okay. Then there's sort of incorporating the goal of this meta-literate view of information literacy. And so if they don't fully get what information literacy is, this is gonna be a little harder. But I'm finding that the threshold concepts are garnering a fair amount of attention and interest. Um, I've mentioned them to several faculty members and they say, do you have an article about that that I could read? When I pick myself up off the floor after I finished fainting, um, I give them one. Um, so, so I think that there's some, some entry points there and then a potential role for badging or other kinds of um, competency-based learning initiatives. The University at Albany, we have had um, strong general education competency requirements, um, both lower level and upper level writing, information literacy, oral discourse and critical thinking um, for a number of years, but in 2000, uh, SUNY Central uh, said that, you know, everybody's going to do these. University at Albany jumped on this really quickly. We had a lot of strong support for information literacy. Those all became courses or components of courses. It couldn't be that, like, in freshman comp, a librarian would go in once or twice and then information literacy would be covered. Um, so there were courses for information literacy on campus, either taught by librarians or taught in the disciplines. Um, we have just had a change in these competency requirements. I've been on the planning of this throughout, and now there's going to be both a lower level requirement for all four of them and an upper level one. So now we have two information literacy requirements, but the upper level one is going into the major. All four of them are going into the major. So it's the responsibility of the department they have new learning objectives to work with. I'll talk about briefly in a minute. And there's lots of new kinds of conversations going on. I'm on the council that actually reviews their plans. And so I'm seeing the good and the not so good. Um, the lower level is mostly going into a new writing and critical inquiry course um, that we did not have before. So what's been really exciting is working on those learning objectives and I think probably because of apathy on some of the part of some of my um, colleagues on the small task force working on it, um, I was able to have a fair amount of influence on what went into it. And so if you look at these three out of the five learning objectives, there are some sort of strong components that do with sort of this meta-literate view um, of information literacy. So as I'm thinking about working with this on campus, um, with the lower level, we're trying to have more extensive use of the badging. That's where those two faculty members I talked about earlier are. They're in that writing and critical inquiry department. And that department is going to start standardizing what they do across the 17 instructors. Um, so this might be a way to do it. And actually, the person in charge of that program caught him on um, the academic podium and just said, you know, are you going to have that meeting soon to decide? And he said, yeah, and what I'm really thinking about is maybe we'll have a writing and critical inquiry badge. So the students, even though they're not going to do all 23 of that one of four badges, they may have a subset of seven or eight, but they're going to have that feeling that I got through all of those and they can show that badge. Um, with the upper level, the threshold concepts um, and badging within the discipline. So perhaps when you're thinking about working with teachers in subject areas or in the disciplines, it's possible um, that they're going to understand a lot with the threshold concepts. We've been seeing that there's been some concern from librarians that the faculty members will not really get these threshold concepts. 
but those who have gone out and started talking to them were not seeing that. So that might be a way to really uh, take a new tack in the conversation we've been having for years uh, about this. Um, and then uh, if you're using something like badging, and I know that there's more people thinking about it or similar things, that might be a way to take um, more generic things and customize it. So, Tom will come back up here, and um, we are open for questions. Thank you for listening. So if you have questions, raise your hand, and Jessica and I will come to you since we're streaming this to our colleagues downstate. We want to make sure we get questions on the microphone or else it's just silence. So whoever wants to start, I'm on my way. Thank you. Do you feel as though having university buy-in on the badging system is essential in terms of you must have a badge or certain badges to graduate. Um, I know in some liberal arts colleges, you must have writing rich classes, for example, to graduate, or you must have a certain diversity element in order to graduate. Do you think badging plays a role in that regard? Um, I can think of, of maybe like three strands to answer that question. And did everybody hear the question? Um, the mic seems very loud. So the question was, um, does there need to be buy-in from the campus on the badging? Um, and so and you mentioned a couple of other elements where um, sort of it's campus-wide. Um, and so would this need to be one of those programs? Um, so the first thing that comes to mind, I know some campuses are thinking about co-curricular transcripts or co-curricular records where, um, so other types of things students are doing could show up on that. And I see some nodding, so it might be we you know, could ask for more information about it. Um, Albany doesn't yet have that. It's sort of thinking about uh, a co-curricular record is what they're going to be calling it if they do it. So that it could be sort of um, legitimatized in some way. Albany is not actually an institution where badging um, is accepted, it's, it's not prevalent. In fact, our badging program is the only current badging program that we know about, but there seems to be some openness to it. Um, and another department has shown some interest in doing it as well. Uh, so I think, and I did speak to uh, somebody at Purdue um, who, there's more going on there with badging. They actually have developed their own badging platform. They would like to sort of get involved with that. So there seem to be a number of different models, but I don't, I think if we can sort of show we're trailblazers or get involved with that co-curricular transcript, there would be entry points. Um, and it wouldn't need to be a situation such as uh, Tom's institution where personal learning with PLAs, uh, prior learning, that prior learning assessment uh, is something that um, is a, a very common concept. Right, mm -hmm. right. I mean, I think any time you have institutional support, the better. But it, what's exciting about these open resources, it doesn't have to depend on that. So uh, an instructor, librarian could be very entrepreneurial and say, this is an open resource. I'm going to build this into my, my, what I'm, my own teaching. And that's really exciting. So it's not something that the, it's not something that's, credentialed in that way. It's not, it does, it's not a, a credit bearing, but I always see it as something that leads to something that's credit bearing because it, it's similar to an assignment. And I think that the folks who, had, who attend our session today and really see what a, what a badge is, the sort of elements are very similar to what you would design in, in your course, but it's delivered in a very different way and it's open and collaborative with other instructors. So in some ways, you have to create this thing, let it go. So I created several quests for Trudy, and they weren't mine for my course. They were part of the badging system, and anyone can use, it, use them. And when I hear from Trudy, and they, she says, my students loved your quests, I'm like, oh, that's great. So it's still that feeling of being a teacher, but you're not as directly involved. So there are many different uh, elements of this.
And we'll remind you to talk closely, as I'm doing, into the microphone so that everyone can hear you. You know, you mentioned these uh, MOOCs and the difference between your expectations and the reality. The question I have is, when you think about the origins of the unwillingness of, of students to be self-directed learners, and obviously the badges is kind of trying to point students in that direction, what other ways have you found to motivate students to be that self-directed? I mean, what's the origins for why they, in these online courses, they can't seem or are unwilling to move in that direction? Like, what, what's the history of that, I guess? That's the only course that I've taught um, in that manner. Um, so I, I think part of it is our students at Albany, the undergraduates particularly, really, um, they take a lot of large classes where they can not even do some of the homework, not even go to the sessions. I mean, if there's 300 people there, how will they know if you're there? So I think that some of them have sort of slipped into this mode of sort of passive learning. And, and that's not going to work for them in this situation. And having this come sort of at the end of their academic career, and there's just one of them, um, having no real preparation for it. There is something that we offer, but I hear the very few students take it. It's an online introduction to online learning. Um, so I, I think it's, it's what's in many, but not all, cases expected of them. But I will turn this to Tom, because he has much more experience with online teaching. This is really a great question, and it's interesting um, as we reflect on the MOOC. We've really been excited about the MOOC and the badge but we, we also did a survey at the end of the MOOC, and we're, we're actually going to, this is something else we're going to write about is that survey and our analysis. So we're starting to, with the excitement of the MOOC is over, and we're starting to look at it critically, critically in terms of what really happened. We're still very excited about what happened and the fact that the resources are there, but when you really look at it from a student perspective, um, we are disappointed in terms of what happened, but in many ways that's back to us. What could we have done, and I hope that in writing this, this next piece that we'll will come to sort of what could we have done differently to better prepare the students? Because the students at, at uh, the University of Albany really uh, weren't prepared for that experience. It wasn't just an online course, it was a radically different connectivist experience that was also blended. So they really weren't ready for that. But it's interesting, the badging experience is very different. So the badging, when you hear Trudy talk about it, it's clear that the students benefited from that but that's something that's brought into the face-to-face -face course, and there's a different kind of context there that maybe made that work compared to the MOOC, although work, the MOOC worked for some students. Um, we do know that self-direction is critically important for the online environment, um, but it works. Students can be very successful, and of course, as the dean of uh, the largest provider of online in the SUNY system, um, we, are, we are successful at doing that, but it doesn't just happen. Uh, and we lose some students too. Um, but we do a lot to prepare our learners. We do uh, assessments in advance to see if they're ready. And some of those assessments are self-assessments for them to determine if they're ready for this online environment. We develop, we have an online orientation to prepare students. We do a lot in terms of the intake when we're talking with prospective students to explain to them what this, this is. And of course, Empire State College, half of the enrollments are online, but the other half are face-to-face. They take place very individualized with mentors in centers throughout New York State. So sometimes a student might want to blend that face-to-face -face experience with the online. Sometimes they might come to us because they think that we're Empire State College, we're a part of it, and then we'll say, well, maybe you, you, know, you live near the Syracuse Center, maybe it would be better for you to pursue your, your study there. So it is, self-direction is key, um, but it's something that can definitely be done. I think that what we'll learn from this is how to prepare students for that environment. And what's interesting is that this is the problem with MOOCs in general. The completion rate for MOOCs is terrible. So what's the model? I think we need a different model for MOOCs, whether it's connectivist or whether it's uh, Coursera-style MOOCs. Um, I'm not sure if 500, 1,000 students really is what is, you know, we get excited about hearing those numbers, but I'm not convinced that that's really what it takes. I think it's trying to find smaller groups with, within that environment. For example, we cap our online courses at 20 to 22. We don't do 500 students in a course. We just did it for the MOOC.
Hi, I have a comment more than a question, but maybe you could tell us um, maybe how this resonates with your work or your thinking. Um, as we're talking about badges, I'm thinking a lot about motivation, student motivation. Um, Trudy, you mentioned that in learning about badges, you really beca became engaged in seeking them out. They were almost inherently motivating to you. Um, so I'm thinking of them as sort of performing um, a meta-affective function where um, they might help us open conversations with students about their own mo motivation. Um, do you find that that, that might uh, be the case, that these might serve a purpose in opening a conversation about student motivation? I think the potential is, is definitely there to do that. I like that sort of meta-affective idea. Um, maybe next time, if I, when I teach this summer and I don't have them do 23 of them, um, we could do a little bit more about that. But uh, uh, I definitely think that that's a possibility. And some of them are written such that even if we're not necessarily talking to them directly about it, um, their thinking is reflected in what they're doing, which gives me a much better sense of my students. Um, but I think, I think that you're right. I think that that potential is definitely there. And I'll just comment too, I, I think with, within the badging, because in many ways the badging, uh, what we're asking students to do, it's either writing or it's creating something and it is that very much uh, meta sort of reflection piece. I think in the MOOC, um, there was some of that as well because it was sort of the, the novelty of what a MOOC is and some of them were blogging about that experience. Um, another interesting thing that happened is that we originally thought, okay, great, we'll do this massive open online course, we'll have students from University of Albany and students from Empire State College. And for some reason, undergrad, our undergraduate students weren't as um, excited about doing the MOOC, so we didn't get any undergraduate enrollments from my institution. However, it was also open to graduate students, and we did have one graduate student who did a meta-analysis of MOOCs, and it was just brilliant. He ended up doing his own survey after we did our survey, um, and he worked closely with a faculty member, and he was doing that. So he, what his contribution was, not only participating in the MOOC itself, but taking it to that higher level as a graduate student would do, doing a survey and being able to an analyze not only our MOOC, but also our, our MOOC within the context of other MOOCs that are out there. So I, again, I think there's such great potential for, for that kind of reflection. Your talk, and I'm um, really excited about how you're emphasizing metacognition. I think this is a really interesting idea of metacognition um, being a part of the, the badging. Um, I'm not that familiar with badging, and um, I know that you mentioned initially kind of thinking, what, badging? That's not really going to be the right fit. And um, so I have a couple of concerns about badging that I don't know maybe were also concerns for you, but I would be interested in your perspectives on it. Um, so I guess one is, I understand that they're intended to motivate students in this MOOC environment where there hasn't been a lot of retention. But um, if it could be seen as this kind of like external motivator that um, kind of de-emphasizes the deeper reasons that students might be learning. Um, and I guess my other concern is if, well, also that it becomes a kind of commodification of the learning process, um, or that it oversimplifies the very complex skills that you're trying to have students learn. I get, and that was my, my bigger concern that, well, now I'm a master of, you know, critical thinking or, you know, fill in the blank, when in reality, they're going to be continuing to develop these skills. So if there are ways that you address those types of concerns. Um, so actually, um, we didn't use the badging with the MOOC. Um, you're, you're anticipating a grant that we hope we're going to get for this fall, <laughs> um, where we're going to be doing an X MOOC on Coursera, where we would include the badging. Um, so we've sort of done that separately from the MOOC, but uh, we do hope that it would provide some motivation and, and interest on the parts of students. Um, I understand the concerns um, sort of about um, students feeling that they're m more masters than they may be by the time they 
do it. And uh, commodification was the other element that you mentioned. So uh, we're trying to make them so unusual in a way and delving into areas that students maybe do not see as what they think of as information literacy. So um, Tom maybe will explain in a minute one that he did um, that I wasn't really getting that sense. I mean, I had some students who just sort of went through them and you know filled out what they could, but because they were asking the students to think about how they would do it, how they would value things, how, how they would interact with things. I wasn't getting as much of that as you might expect. The idea of them feeling that they're more masters than they truly are um, could be an issue. Um, I, I don't know that we've thought about that an enormous amount. Um, when we provide the metadata that would go with this, it would sort of give an overview, of, first of all, who is credentialing the students, and then an overview of what they did. And it wouldn't highlight so much any particular element within it that those who are looking at that metadata would feel this, but the person themselves could. And that's a really interesting point that I'm going to want to think about more. So thank you. Did, did I address the areas you, because Tom might also have things he wants to say, but that you had brought up? Another great question. Um, I think, you know, the, the badges, the, the ones that, uh, that I've seen, and I, I developed a few quests and worked on this, this one thread, um, they're, they're interesting and they're complex, and the fact that they're framed within that constellation I think it shows that it's not just um, something that you would follow in a, a linear way. It kind of shows an environment. Um, and you could you know, be really cynical and say, and I'm not saying you're being cynical, but I'm just saying you could, you could say, well, if someone gets an A in an information literacy course, it's sort of like, or a composition course, well, oh, well, they're great writers and they're set, that's all they need to do. Um, so it's, I, I would parallel it to that idea too. We wouldn't, make, we wouldn't make that assumption, but I think it's a great question. It's definitely something to think about sort of what, what do the badges mean? And the fact too that they're not grades, they're badges, you know, how seriously are they, are they taking them and, and how much, you know, what kind of meaning do they, they place onto them? The fact that in this early experimenting that they've uh, responded in such a positive way I think is very encouraging and that they probably see them as pieces of the constellation. Um, so I think that that's uh, re really important as, as well. Oh, should I mention? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I knew there was something else I wanted to say. Um, so I worked on, I've been hearing uh, Trudy talk about how exciting it is and how fun it is to create these badges. And then I, uh, she challenged me to write uh, several quests and a badge focused on, uh, it was format type, but we, did we call it something else? Format type. Uh, format is called, or the, uh, the early ones or the one that you did recently? Was, yeah, the recent ones. Oh, For, I forgot what it was called, it. actually. So format type, it was really about the packaging and all that. I can't remember right now. But I took this idea. I was immediately, I really struggled with it at first. How am I going to build this into a badge? And what am I going to ask students to think about? The badge I created, the, fir the first quest I created, asked students to, um, oh, what, is, what are we calling it? Collaborative creation, that's why she sent it to me. Collaborative creation with uh, feedback mechanisms, speaking out, and informed consumer. And it actually uh, developed from that. So feedback mechanisms, we were thinking about um, trying to, how do you look critically at you know, reviews, like TripAdvisor reviews or book reviews? These are things that are in social media all the time. Um, it's user-generated information that can inform what you're thinking. So instead of just discounting it because someone you don't know or a bunch of people you don't know are reviewing something, whether it's a book or a, a, a hotel or something, how would you kind of look at that critically? So I came up with this idea of um, having students plan a trip to Speaker's Corner in London where it's at Speaker's Corner in London, you can um, basically go and say whatever you, you want. Um, and I was really focused on, okay, well, if you're going to take this trip to London, how would you get there? 
How would you create your budget? How would you use Expedia and user reviews? Um, how would you uh, make critical decisions about the hotel you're going to stay at based on the reviews? Because I do this all the time. I secretly, uh, I'm an anonymous person on TripAdvisor, and I love it, and I'm always providing reviews. So you know, kind of work that into it. Um, so, how, but how do you take that information in a critical way and also write write things? And um, it was interesting. I thought it was really smart and had a really good idea. And Trudy said, well, this is really good, but you should do a continuation quest where the students actually go to Speaker's Corner. What are they going to say? I'm like, oh my god, how did I miss that? That's like the most important part of it. So that led to, we did the feedback mechanism where they're reviewing all of this sort of social information. But then I built the, um, the speaking out because I found some really great resources for Speaker's Corner that were focused on democracy and speaking your mind and what, what that is. And there was actually a website on speaking out and sort of the responsibility of that. It all came back to information literacy and the, the kinds of things we're trying to teach our students um, in finding a voice and researching uh, ideas critically. So that was the continuation quest. And then the other piece of it we were, we were talking about in dialogue was, well, we know that we want students to be producers of information, but they're also consumers. So what is that piece? So I created another quest called Informed Consumer. Uh, and then that all led to this collaborative uh, creation, um, what is that called? Collaborative oh, creation. challenge. The challenge, the ultimate challenge, the collaborative creation challenge. So I did that whole section on the collaborative creation piece. Um, and through dialogue with Trudy, it, was, uh, it really expanded beyond sort of my original ideas about it. And it was pretty complex. And then Trudy's telling me how much the students enjoyed the responses and how substantive the responses were. So I was really excited about it. So it looks like we have one minute left. Oops. So perhaps we have one more question. Oh, I guess this would be kind of a quick one. Um, can you, Trudy, can you comment on to the next revision, the next draft of the information literacy standards? Can you give us any sort of teaser about what the conversation has been and where you guys are looking for the next draft? Um, Yes, uh, we've been getting an enormous amount of feedback from the form that is available online. People have been filling it out both individually and as groups. We've been reviewing it. We have an in-person meeting in Chicago next week um, and we're going to really be looking at um, you know what is it that we can make changes to. We've already started to make changes. We have um, um, the meta literacy learning objectives have been removed from each of the threshold concepts, but are going to be integrated better into uh, either the um, knowledge practices or the um, dispositions, depending where they belong. Um, we are doing some rewriting of some of the threshold concepts. We're adding additional material, so there will be an introduction for faculty members that will be like one page, one for administrators. There will be, um, okay, there, we're going to be talking about the sandbox idea, the online space. Um, Troy, what am I missing? <laughs> I, I don't even want to, I don't know. You're, you're getting most of it. Yeah. yeah, so anyway, so I guess the important point is that we're taking the feedback extremely seriously. We hope to have a new draft up in June, um, and there'll be time for comment um, before and during annual, um, but then it has some other processes that it has to go through. Our hope is to have the ACRL board um, consider it at a fall meeting. Okay. Thank you all very much. We just want to close with this. Oh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. And before you two leave the stage, um, I just want to let's thank them again. Um, thank you for that presentation. I also wanted to thank them. Um, well, the team wanted to thank them for donating their time. Um, we keep this summit really, I think, inexpensive, and we can only do that because of the generosity of people like Trudy and Tom, who bring their incredible knowledge and experience and share it with us um, and don't charge us money. So um, an extra special thank you to them and just a token of our gratitude. Thank you. A little oh, memory of Chicago. So oh, oh, thank you so much. Wow. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so thank you again. Thank you.